Welcome to Book Me Podcast, sponsored by Nimbus Publishing. I'm Lindsay Glode Rainingbird. Join me as we journey through contemporary Canadian literature, reading as much as we can and chatting with authors, illustrators, and other bookish folk, celebrating our dynamic, diverse, and vibrant national literary scene as we go. So grab a snack, get cozy, break that binding, dog ear those pages, let's dig into it. Today we're talking to writer and photographer Nicola Davison about her new YA novel, Decoding.Grey. It's a tender story of a girl grappling with grief and finding her place in the world. Set mostly in an animal shelter filled with a menagerie of endearing and quirky characters, both human and not, it's imaginative, touching, with a bit of mystery thrown in. I loved it, and I think you will too. Welcome, Nicola. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for coming. So where did the inspiration for Decoding.Grey strike? Well, I worked in an animal shelter in my mid-20s, and it was one of those jobs where I thought, this is my dream job. I get to work with animals and animal people. And I, I knew there was euthanasia involved, but of course, as you work there, the longer you work there, the harder it can be on an animal lover. So I worked there for a year or two and then moved on to working in vet clinics and uh, doggy daycares, all sorts of animal things. Uh, and so I always had these sort of stories inside me that I wanted to tell. And I love animals, so I, I wanted to write an animal-centric novel. I also volunteered at the SPCA when I was a preteen. So oh. for me, it was just like, wow, this is exactly right. You nailed it. Like, I was just like, I remember so much of this. Like, the laundry was just a visceral memory for me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what was the writing process like for this novel? It was actually pretty linear, this particular novel. The only bump I had was that when I wrote it initially, it took place in modern day. So she, Dot, was texting a lot. That was kind of her outlet. And about a third of the way through, I thought, well, I better go back and have a tour of the SPCA. So I made an appointment and I had a look at the shelter and I was blown away by the improvements they had made, things like paddling pools for the dogs in the, in the summertime and indoor-outdoor kennels, and they have a vet clinic set up on site, and it's a no-kill shelter. So I realized that in order for the story of Dot and her mother to take place, I had to rewind. So I set it in the year that I worked there, which was 1997, which gave me license to explore nostalgia for the 90s at the same time. Which yeah. is awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes that can take you out of a novel when they're just spending a lot of time in tech. So I really like that choice to go back in time a bit and minimize it. It makes it easier, really, because they don't have this, you know, if, when they're in an emergency situation, they can't simply reach for their phone and call 911. You have to find other parts of the well, story. Well, and Dot has a pager, right? Yes. Yeah, so that was and always She's not fun. great with the pager. <laughs> really not great with it. As, and, and again, when I was working at the shelter, I had a pager. I also did animal control. So I would have a pager every weekend and I hated the sound. And they're so alarming when they go off that really sharp beep. So I thought Dot would definitely feel the same about that. So your character Dot has kind of a physical tick where she taps out Morse code with her fingers. That's right. Yeah. Where did that inspiration for that come from? The idea. The idea of it, I think, was more I understood that she was going to be very uncomfortable with people, like a lot of sensitive, nervous people, myself included, uh, you tend to need an outlet of some kind. So that made sense to me. Her, the character's named Dot, so dashes and dots. Yeah. And her age, uh, her grandfather went through World War II, so he was using Morse code at the time. Um so it, it became a natural part of the story, and it became the language between her and her mother, a private, quiet way that they could communicate, and a wonderful way for somebody who can't really say what they want to say to use, you know, another method to kind of communicate. I really like that. But you said in some of the PR around the book that you don't actually know Morse code at all. <laughs> Not at all. No, I might manage SOS, but I bet you I'd be too nervous in a situation to, <laughs> to remember it. I just did my research 
as with anything when you're writing fiction. Of you, course, you, yeah. There's so many resources these days. So the funny thing is, after the book was completely edited and ready to go to print, I did encounter a signal specialist. I, I, we were sitting there at a barbecue talking about the book, and he started talking to me in Morse code. He started doing the dot, 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 dash, dash, dash verbally to uh -oh. me. <laughs> to give us, I really don't know Morse code. <laughs> You're like, uh-huh, okay, sure. Just play it off. Yeah. Fake it till you make it. Yeah, yeah. Something else I was curious about was why make the move to YA for this novel? And what changes do you make or keep in mind or do differently when you're planning to make a genre change like that? Well, the novel really was written for adults, um, but the main character is 18 years old. So it's a it's definitely a coming of age story. What you might call upper YA, it's for people that are, you know, 16, 17, just on the threshold of going out into the world. So I really didn't make any changes. I'm not trying to appeal to a younger audience. It just so happens that we have a very mature reading audience in their teens. It made sense for us to market it as YA because that it would appeal to someone who's ready to take that next step in life. They don't want to read about people that are 12 or 13 at that point in their lives. They want to be reading about where am I going next. Talk me through the cover art because and the whole design of the book because I just loved it. It just oh, good. grabs you right away. I really like the look of this book. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I was very involved in the cover this time. Uh, Jen Embry is the one that did the cover. I knew that I wanted to have a crow or a rat on the front because they're such major characters. Certainly the crow, Toby, who is rescued on the very first page of the book, had to be front and center. And the Morse code is, of course, kind of laid in behind the crow. And that is a, a major part of who Dot is. Um, and my and my first book, we had a photo on the front. I'm a photographer. It, you know, maybe that's you took why that we, photo. we went. Yeah. I, no, I didn't take no. that photo. No. Oh. Um, but I wanted to go with an illustrated cover because they pop for me. When I'm when I'm looking at shelves, I, I like the illustrated covers. I like the latitude you have with what subjects you choose. And so, yeah, and I, I wanted the blue and the orange. And I since, I've since realized that I have a lot of, of this particular blue and this particular orange <laughs> in my life because I put my book on the shelf and thought, oh, it matches my business card. It matches the it's way your vibe. I, it is. Yeah. So, yeah, it's very much me, the, the cover. Well, it's great. It's great. It is very eye-catching. And I love the type, too, like everything about it. And you're talking about Toby the Crow. He's a character that is just extra endearing in the book. I loved him. I just love crows in general. So I was curious, what made you want to include a character that was so much part of the novel that's a crow? It just came to me because where I sit and write sometimes is my dining room and I hear the crows. When I was in the editing process of the first book, there was a crow funeral that took place just outside my window. So the trees Gosh. on both sides of the road were filled with crows. And I want to say hundreds, but that's probably an exaggeration. But it turned out what had happened was two crows must have a fight or something. And there were two dead crows, one on either side of the street. It really struck me how intelligent they are and how much they take care of their own. I've since listened to podcasts and done a little reading and, and heard the story of a crow in Vancouver who's become quite a character as well. He stole the knife from a crime scene at one point. <laughs> <laughs> so I think crows are just fascinating, hilarious. I love the way they strut around. I've gotten to know the, the local crows. It just made sense for Dot because crows do caw in a certain sequence sometimes between each other. You can tell when they're calling to another family member that they found something. You can tell when they're mad. And of course, Dot is working in a domestic animal shelter, not a wildlife center. Right. So it, it's a disruption for her right away that she's bringing in a wild animal. So that seemed like a very good point to start breaking up her routine. Sure. It also seemed kind of they were expecting something like that. Oh, Dot, here she is yes. doing something again. That's right. She can't leave anything alone. Yeah. <laughs> so a little bit darker. <laughs> Both your novels explore themes of grief and its ongoing effect on our lives and those around us. What draws you to that theme? Because you kind of explored it in your last book as well. I think it just comes from a storyteller's necessity of throwing the hardest thing you can at your character. So when I conceived of someone who worked at an animal shelter and cared so much for small lives and who is 
also forced to euthanize at times and make really difficult decisions, I thought, what could be the worst thing that could happen? And that is to have your favorite person in the world in unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. She's in hospital, she's alive, but she's unable to communicate. And they're not sure, you know, if she will ever come out of that, but it seems quite certain that she won't. So that I thought would be the hardest thing for Dot. And, you know, for somebody who's just getting used to the world, then uh, it's, it's even more so. So high stakes, I guess, is why death and grief get thrown in. I think in both novels, there's a theme of, of motherhood, too, of Dot is so close to her mother, but in a way that's somewhat unhealthy because they're so, they're, they're friends to each other, they're best friends to each other. So when that tie is severed, it really throws Dot into flux. And for this particular situation, it's interesting to, to see the way that people respond to it. So Dot is more convinced that she's not going to come out of it, but her father is still holding on. So I really like the way that you showed that difference, even in one family of who believes that something miraculous can happen and those who are grounding themselves in like the reality that it probably won't. Yes. Yeah. And again, through research, I found that that was very common that there would be one family member that might hang on and really, you know, cling to any story that they'd heard of somebody waking up. And, you know, I think the majority of people understand that this is a hopeless situation. And I also, I, I spoke to a friend of mine who's been a nurse for a long time, and, and she gave me the perspective of the care workers. And they're as divided sometimes as the, the families. There's somebody in the hospital who's taking up space that others could be using. Do you think you would hold on? I feel like I would hold oh. on to the last moment. I'd be like, nope, yeah. you're here until you're gone on I your know. own. <laughs> I don't think you know until. I mean, until I don't want to be that way, but yeah. I feel like selfishly, I'd be like, I can't let you go. Yeah. And it depends, I think, on the age of the person. I think if it was a child, it would be really difficult to let go. Um, maybe somebody that's elderly and has had a wonderful life, you might feel that it's okay. But um, Dot's mother would be hmm, probably in her 40s somewhere. So, you know, still a lot of life left. Yeah. Yeah. In your bio on your website, you say your twin jobs of writer and photographer are similar in that both require you to find the light, which I love that. Can you elaborate a little bit on that connection, how being a photographer informs your writing or vice versa? Yes. I think that I'm very visual, and I've been told that my writing is visual. As a photographer, the first thing I do is I find the angle, and I try to frame things. And of course, that is very limited by the amount of light or if I have to bring in my own light. So it is similar in storytelling. You want to pick that point of view. You want to narrow it down. You want to reduce distractions, all of those things. You're, as a photographer, you're constantly looking at that background and just trying to get that red stop sign <laughs> just out of frame, you know, and, and make your subject really pop. And you're trying to tell a story, too. So I do um, a lot of work with a community center in Dartmouth, and I do a lot of sort of storytelling in my photos with them. I'm trying to show relationships a lot, and, and it's, it's kind of fun to be able to do that, showing uh, whether it's somebody working there, how they interact with clients coming in, or if it's parent-child relationships. So you're doing that when you're, when you're storytelling as well. You're just trying to cut out all the things that are unnecessary so that you can tell something very fresh, something that will, you know, keep people turning the pages. Yeah, and see that relationship, just the punch yeah, of it. Exactly, yeah. And what are you currently reading? I am reading a book called Wonder World by K.R. Bigden, who is a local author. And it's a story of um, someone in his 20s who's queer, and he's returning to a Mennonite, his Mennonite small town after having left under difficult circumstances. And it's uh, it, even that could be a sad story, but it's actually quite funny with a quirky main character. The, my favorite kind of thing is when you've got that quirky main character whose lens on life is different. And I don't know a lot about the Mennonite communities in Canada, so it's really fun to pop in there and, and find out what it's really like to grow up that way. And I just finished Nancy Regan's from showing off to showing up, 
Which, talked to her last week. Did you talk to her? Yeah. Oh, oh, she's amazing. Yeah. I got to spend some time with her at Digby Pines. So a lot of what's in the book, we we discussed over dinner and cocktails and various things. But uh, the dream. Oh, yeah. That was, it was great fun because her whole message is to essentially be yourself, to show up as yourself. Uh, flaws and all. And uh, that has been my recent journey in the last couple of years is to just embrace who I am. And it's it's a lot more difficult than it sounds. As she says, when you say just be yourself, the first problematic word is just. So Not so easy. <laughs> not so easy. But finally, in my 50s, I feel like I'm starting to just be myself. And uh, anyway, I recommend that to any introverted author about to sit behind a microphone. It helps. <laughs> I think about her book almost every day. I'm Do like, you? Remember yeah. what Nancy said? Yeah. And then her Show pod- <laughs> her podcast, of course, The Soul Booth. If you can listen to that episode with Elizabeth Gilbert, it's it's fantastic. Yeah. Highly recommend. Well, thank you for the recommendations. I'm already yeah. going to add that book that you were talking about to the top of my list. And it's, it's got a great cover as well with, with a jar of pickles on the front. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I don't know what that means yeah. yet, but I'm sure yeah, I will. There, there's a, I believe there's a paragraph in the novel that will make all of that clear. <laughs> <laughs> and you have an excerpt for us. Do you want to introduce it a little bit? I do. So this just introduces Dot's father to us a little bit. My father the self-proclaimed sleep king of Atlantic Canada. When the kids put together that I was the daughter of Matt Trust, trademark pending, the bullying got worse. I was already a target with my motor tics, disrupting reading time by tapping the words out. They called me Rusty. They treated me like a mat made up insipid rhymes, if only Dad had given it some thought before registering the name. Even now, you'll argue it with anyone who listen. It's meant to be mattress trust. Mattrust. Get it? Trust in one's mattress. If only I'd been around to consult. But I was still waiting in the fallopian tube, a bona fide dot. Many a night, I drifted off to sleep thinking of better company names. Alliteration would have been a good choice, even its previous name. The mattress store would have been fine. If it weren't for the commercials... My royal lineage might have remained a secret. In one of them, I was coerced into starring as the sleeping girl, my only acting role. Who sleeps with their glasses on? The kids laughed, holding me down at the top of the slide, where the teachers couldn't see. I'd just gotten glasses, and Dad argued that I couldn't see without them. Anyway, kids don't like it when you're a small-time star. Try to stand out and... You get stuffed into a garbage can alongside banana peels and egg salad sandwiches. Then they harass you for the way you smell. Every commercial began with Dad lying on his side, a close-up of his face, sagging a bit on the pillow. How did you sleep last night? Then he'd have a wonderful nugget of information about what a lack of sleep will do to a person. The kids like to imitate his English accent badly, finishing off with the Queen's wave before abandoning me. Hair nodded to the monkey bars. The camera would pan out to a showroom filled with high-quality mattresses at an affordable price. Layaway available, pun fully intended. Right in the middle of them, Dad on his back, arms behind his head. It would end with me, eyes closed, very convincingly underneath my purple framed spectacles. Now, with the tops of my glasses hidden by my hat, people say, nice hat or nice glasses. It's the art of disguise. Watch any spy film and you'll see how a hat can transform a person. No one says, hey, it's the short-sighted sleeping girl. It's the perfect combination of humor, but also kind of that tinge of sadness, yeah. like, oh, what a sad <laughs> childhood. Yeah. I yeah. love that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoy chatting about books. Absolutely. Yeah. Write another one and I'll bring you back. Oh, okay. I promise. <laughs> Get I <will>. on that. <laughs> Decoding.Gray by Nicola Davison is available now everywhere books are sold. And thank you for listening and hanging out with us. Join me next time on this book lover's journey as we try to read more, read Canadian, read local. You know, all the good things. <laughs>